Bubba Third is like the red-headed stepchild of a Blackadder franchise in that you never really see many people discussing it, probably because it's not quite as good as Blackadder Goes Forth or Blackadder 2 and nowhere near as divisive as the first series, and that's a shame because Blackadder the Third has some classic episodes in it. But before we get to the episodes, let's discuss any changes that have occurred between series. Bang, boom, oh, drink. First name? Well, I'm not sure. <laughs> well, you must have some idea. Well, it might be sod off. With the success of Blackadder 2, there weren't any major changes to the format of the show, like there were between the two prior seasons. However, as I intimated at the end of my Series 2 video, the principal cast was far too large for a 30 minute comedy show with only 6 episodes per season, so I'm sure with that in mind the principal cast was reduced from 6 to 4. Gone were Lord Melchick, Queen Elizabeth and Nursey, with the change from the Elizabethan era to the Georgian one. I'm also sad to report that one of my favourite characters has also left the show never to return. That being Lord Percy Percy, with Tim McKinney being unwilling to return for another series due to fears of being typecast as the bungling idiot sidekick. Although he, Stephen Fry and Miranda Richardson left the main cast, they all do however make one episode guest role appearances in the series. Once again, Rowan Atkinson returns, this time as Mr. E. Blackadder, continuing Edmund's slide down the social scale. He is the Prince Regent's manservant and butler, having to contend with or cash in on George's predilection for the fads of the age. He's also even more conniving than prior incarnations of the character. Prince George himself is played by Hugh Laurie, who for the first time joins the principal cast having appeared in a guest role in two episodes last season. George largely takes the role of Lord Percy Percy, being a vain idiot, although he is, as we will see, far more central to the plots of every episode than Percy was. Tony Robinson returns as Baldrick, who is once again in the service of Blackadder as his personal dog's body. Thankfully, he's given way more to do here than he was in series 2. The principal cast is rounded out by Helen Atkinson Wood, making her debut in the series as Mrs. Miggins, an actress who, as far as I can tell, has only ever appeared in this series of Blackadder and one episode of The Young Ones, plus a few guest appearances in quiz and daytime TV shows, such as QI, where she allegedly holds the highest cumulative total of any guests. Mrs. Miggins was mentioned a few times, but never seen in series 2 as a pie shop owner. Here she owns a coffee shop that Black Eider often frequents, and appears in all 6 episodes of series 3. With that out of the way, we are ready to tackle the first episode, Dish and Dishonesty, which first aired 17th of September 1987, and is something Sean Connery would never be able to say properly. Smeared my opponent! Bribed the press to be on my side and threatened to talk to the electorate if we lost. Failed to see what more a decent politician could have done. This episode is one of my favourites from this third series, being a satire of the general corruption of politics, where we see William Pitt the Younger be elected Prime Minister and set out his policies, which are well these. War with France. <laughs> Two. Tougher sentences for geography teachers. <laughs> and three. A right will kick of the prince's backside! Which are weirdly more sensible than the current Prime Ministers. Two of these are by the by for Blackadder, but the third is deadly dangerous and cuts him off from his main source of income, the idiot Prince of Wales George, who has managed to spend this stupendous amount of 50 some thousand pounds on socks alone this year, the obvious implication being that Blackadder is in fact stealing them and then selling them on. I described Prince George as a character akin to Lord Percy Percy earlier, and that is fairly true. He's a bumbling idiot, but whereas Percy was a definite sidekick, George is far more a central character to most of the plots within this series. That makes him a far funnier one as a result in my opinion, as it means all three of the principal cast get far more opportunities to interact and bounce jokes off of each other. We get an introduction to just how stupid George is straight away, 
with this exchange between him and Black Adder. Only the other day I was out in the street and they sang, We hail Prince George! We hail Prince George! We hate Prince George. <laughs> we hate Prince George. Of course, a problem needs a cunning plan and Black Adder has the perfect one. Initially they intend to bribe Sir Talbot Buxomly, who also has some uh, interesting policies. Well, according to Who's Who, his interests include flogging servants, shooting poor people, and the extension of slavery to anyone who hasn't got a knighthood. Obviously, this entire episode is a not so subtle satire of the Thatcherite politics of the late 80s Britain. Not exactly surprising with Ben Elton being a non Labour supporter. What is even more surprising, though, is Sir Talbot would be even more at home with the current Conservative government with policies like those. Anyway, Sir Talbot scuppers this plan by instantly up and dying. So Blackadder has one more cunning plan that will solve the problem, and as an added bonus will enrich him whilst doing it. He will buy the rotten borough of Donny on the Wold, a tiny plot of land in the Suffolk Fens with three mangy cows, a dachshund named Colin, a small hen in its late 40s and one voter. Baldrick is to be the candidate. We also learn that Baldrick's name is Sod Off because that's what all the children used to say to him when he tried to play with them. He of course wins the election by gaining 16,472 votes, all cast by the single voter, Blackadder, who moved to the constituency after the previous voter died mysteriously by accidentally chopping his own head off combing his hair. We also get the first in a series of meta fourth wall breaking jokes, but a somewhat of a feature of this series with a cameo from Vincent Hanna, a BBC journalist famed for his coverage of by-elections as his own ancestor, also a journalist famed for his coverage of by-elections. It will come as no surprise that Baldrick then cocks his plan up by voting with Pitt the Younger instead of against him. Blackadder then has to come up with another cunning plan, this one as he himself says. I've got a plan so cunning you could put a tail on it and call it a weasel. This time he will get ennobled and join the House of Lords, gaining a huge sum of money in the process from Prince George to bribe a few lords just to make sure they vote in favour of the Prince. Except George is an absolute moron and he ennobles Baldrick. So technically Baldrick is Lord Baldrick, who spent the money on a giant turnip his dream turn it. Meaning this is a rare episode of Blackadder where the problem is never actually solved. In fact, we finish the episode with Blackadder in a much worse position than when he started it, as he is now hugely indebted to pay for his Lord's robes he just purchased. I think this episode really sets up this series of the show very well, showing exactly how the slim down cast are going to interact and what formula the general plots are going to take with the satire still being scarily very relevant today, with George having some absolutely laugh out loud moments, no more than when he tries to say anti disestablishmentarianism and ends up saying this after two days of trying. Anti-distinctly minty monetarism. Hugh Laurie basically steps into the show as a main cast member and is brilliant from his very first scene in other words. Baldrick is once again front and centre of a plot and there's a, that's a good thing because the interactions between him and Edmund are generally the best bits of the show for me. Edmund himself is even more conniving and witty than ever, a man who is far more intelligent than everyone around him and well aware of it and as a result has some brilliant one-liners throughout this first episode. It also sets up the fact that this series will mainly revolve around a problem of the week and cunning plans that fail due to circumstance and stupidity, a formula that has given us some of the best episodes in prior series. A formula that is once again very evident in episode 2, Ink and Incapability, which first aired on the 24th of September 1987. I've done C and D. Right, let's have it then. Right. Big blue wobbly thing that mermaids live in. This has always been one of my least favourite episodes, being an episode that revolves around the creation of the very first dictionary and as our first ever disappointing major guest star, we open with Prince George intimating to Blackadder that he will patronise Dr Samuel Johnson's new book. Johnson is this week's guest star being Robbie Coltrane, 
an actor that I usually really enjoy in everything, with Cracker being the show of his I enjoyed the most, but here he's just slightly on the wrong side of Hammy for my liking, as in these examples. Reputation well deserved, sir! Farewell! Oh! Blast my eyes! In my fury I have left my dictionary with your foolish master! It, it's the sort of performance that falls into that comedic, uncanny valley of neither being entirely straight in opposition to someone being totally over the top, nor is it quite over the top enough to be funny in of itself. It's not all bad from Coltrane, though as he probably gets one of the biggest laughs of the entire episode with this description of his devotion to his work. My mother died, I hardly noticed. My father cut off his head and fried it in garlic in the hope of attracting my attention. I scarcely looked up from my work. My wife brought armies of lovers to the house who worked in droves so that she might bring up a huge family of bastards. I can't not. But on the whole, Dr. Johnson is probably the first guest character in the entire run of the show. I don't particularly enjoy and neither, as it turns out, does Blackadder, who holds a grudge against Johnson for never replying to him when he sent his own novel he has been writing for seven years, Edmund, A Butler's Tale, written under the pseudonym Gertrude Perkins. With this grudge in mind, he obviously tries to discourage the prince from patronising the dictionary, and he keeps inventing new words much to the annoyance of Johnson. As for George, well he's such a thicko, he doesn't actually grasp at what a dictionary is. And the hero's name is what? <laughs> there is no hero, sir. No hero? <laughs> well, lucky I reminded you, better put one in pronto. It's at this point that Johnson says that his book is in fact the second greatest book ever made, behind Edmund the Butler's tale, leading to Blackadder changing his opinion of Dr. Johnston instantly. Only one problem, Baldrick has seemingly burnt the dictionary, so of course every problem needs a cunning plan to solve it. Initially they plan to steal a copy of the dictionary and give this back to Johnson, which is where we get our first glimpse of Mrs. Miggins' pie shop. Now Mrs. Miggins, I am convinced, purely exists so that there was a female in this series, because she has almost nothing to do at any point. She gets almost no jokes, and if you just cut a line from literally any episode and gave them to some other character, it wouldn't actually change very much of anything. And here is no different with the real scene stealers being Shelley, Byron and Coolridge flouncing about in the background. In reality, none of these men were contemporaries. But Blackadder is full of historical anachronisms like this, especially in this third series, and their flouncing in the background is always a highlight of this episode for me. Johnson then enters the coffee shop and reveals he does not possess a copy of his dictionary, because if anyone happened to lose the original, he would murder them. Which leads us to the next cunning plan, this time Baldrick's which is basically turn the burnt string, brush the soot off and attach the papers back on, uh, the very ones that no longer exist, which leaves Blackadder no other choice but to rewrite the dictionary. Of course George and Baldrick attempt to help, George with this rather pathetic joke about belching. Well, I had a bit of trouble with belching, but I think I got it sorted out in the end. <coughs> oh no! There I go again! And Baldrick, what please with dog? Yes, and your definition of dog is? Not a cat. Of course Edmund fails miserably to complete 10 years of work in an evening, falls asleep, has a bizarre dream involving Baldrick being an Alsatian, wakes up and is just about to be horribly murdered via having things inserted into his unmentionables when Prince George reveals he had the dictionary all along and that Baldrick actually burnt Edmund a butler's tale, with the episode ending with Johnson storming out once he realises his dictionary doesn't include the word sausages. That brings to a close, as I said previously, one of my least favourite episodes, because for me a lot of the jokes are different flavours of the exact same joke, and the joke wasn't that funny in the first place, so by the fourth or fifth time I've heard Edmund make up a ridiculous word, I'm starting to groan. Thankfully episode 3, Nob and Nobility, that originally first aired on the 1st of October 1987, is an improvement, because we get a very familiar face as guest star. The Comte de Frufru. <laughs> uh, he's pretty down on his luck, and he's made that horse's willy last all morning. Yes, it's the return of Tim McKinney, 
in a guest star role or two, or maybe even three. With this episode being a satire of the French Revolution, the Scarlet Pimpernel, and just the general disdain English people have for the cheese-eating surrender monkeys from across the channel. This is of course a very fertile ground for humour. We open with Edmund discovering that Mrs Miggins coffee shop has become Mrs Miggins suspiciously large sausage shop full of French aristocrats. A situation that of course annoys Blackadder no end. He's even more annoyed when he returns home to find Prince George fawning over the Scarlet Pimpernel with his two very effete friends Lords Topper and Smedley. With McKinney being Topper and Smedley being played by Neil from the Young Ones, Nigel Planner. McKinney puts on possibly one of the most ridiculous accents I've ever heard. And they both have the same catchphrase. Oh no! Oh no! Damn! Damn! Edmund of course bets them he can enter France, rescue an Aristo and be back for the Ambassador's Ball, where Prince George will unveil the most fabulous trousers ever to be worn. This being Blackadder, he of course has no intention of going to France. Instead he goes to Mrs Miggins' suspiciously large sausage shop and prays a Frenchy French face to pretend he rescued him. Le Comte de Froufrou is of course Tim McKinney. Once they reach the French Ambassador's Ball, it is at this point the real star of this episode reveals himself. Yes, it's Chris Barry as the revolutionary French Ambassador. His various back and forth with the Comte and Edmund are hilarious. How dare you, you filthy weasel! Weasel, ha! You want to talk, Aristo Wartog! Wartog! Ha! Ha! When all appears lost, Smedley disguised as the Madame Guillotine turns up and reveals he was the Scarlet Pimpernel, but too late because Blackadder already poisoned him with a suicide pill the Comte gave him. There are seven stages to the pill's effects, and all of them are as ridiculous as the next, with jumping in a corner and dying being the final one. But never fear, because Chris Barry left the cell door open so they escape, bumping into the Comte before returning to Prince George. This series has a lot of background gags. And one of my favourites is the fact that Prince George is such a turnip head that he can't even get his fabulous trousers on. He's managed one leg over the top of his normal ones without Edmund being there to dress and undress him. In fact, Hugh Laurie in general is brilliant as Prince George, a wonderful mix of hammy childlike innocence that sells and elevates even the most obvious of jokes, like this one that closes out the episode. Blackadder, you've just been to France, and you've rescued a French aristocrat. Oh, Blackadder, are you the Scarlet Pimpernel? Absolutely not. <laughs> of course, Edmund wasn't the Scarlet Pimpernel. Smedley and Topper were, which is why Topper also gets poisoned by Blackadder to stop him blabbing to George. This is once again one of my fave episodes. Everyone here is on top form, you've got Chris Barry who has appeared in various brilliant comedy series over the years, including Red Dwarf, which is one of my all time favourite shows, Nigel Planner, another comedy great from The Young Ones and the return of Tim McKinney. The main cast are all also firing on all cylinders, with Baldrick being given some great one liners. It is also here in this season, probably more than any other where cunning plans become not just an occasional series staple, but an episode to episode staple, with Blackadder saying this to Baldrick. Am I jumping the gun, Baldrick, or are the words, I have a cunning plan, marching with ill-deserved confidence in the direction of this conversation? <laughs> certainly are. Oh, forgive me if I don't jump up and down with glee, your record in this department is not exactly 100%. Whereas the prior series had one or two mentions of cunning plans, in all six episodes. This one has either or both Baldrick and Edmund utter the line in every episode, with Baldrick's plans always being less than stellar bar one, and this episode is no different, with his plan basically being that they wait until they've been guillotined before they escape like headless chickens. And I feel we too should say au revoir to this episode before we lose our heads, and move on to episode four, Sense and Senility. An episode that has one particular joke that has become an absolute real life modern meme. <laughs> I'm accustomed as I am to my <laughs> Be 
beyond becoming a somewhat bizarre real life meme is also an hilarious episode comprising several intertwined repeating jokes that then culminate in a rather satisfying ending. The first of these jokes is that Prince George mistakes plays for being real. So when he first goes to the theatre with Blackadder, he reacts like this to the murder of Julius Caesar. Certainly not, you murdering rotter! Guards, arrest that man! The second running joke is started with Ben Elton, the writer of the series, making a cameo as an anarchist who jumps on stage and throws a bomb at Prince George at the end of the play, with George narrowly avoiding death. As a result, he constantly from now on mistakes Baldrick for an anarchist. Ooh. Be glad to have a pressed mass again! <laughs> uh, sir, that is Baldrick spring cleaning. The third is George calling Blackadder, well, this. Mr. Hopelessly Drivelly Can't Write for Toffee Crappy Butler Weed. Which, of course, rather gets under Blackadder's skin, pushing him to want to leave the prince's service. These three repeated jokes lead to the actors from the play becoming George's elocution teachers as he needs to give a rousing speech to the public to increase his standing as they rather despise him. This leads to our fourth and final intertwined running joke, which is that Blackadder constantly says Macbeth in front of the two actors who he's taken a dislike to as they are the stereotypical lovey type actors meaning every time he does, they have to perform this ritual. Rather than Macbeth. <laughs> it is whilst the actors are teaching George where the real life meme comes from, because at some point in the early 2010s, a conservative MP saw this episode and mistook it for an actual instructional video on public speaking, leading to a whole bunch of them from Theresa May to George Osborne even the pig fucker himself Cameron doing the heroic stance, but for real with this being dubbed the Tory power stance. And, and well yes they look as ridiculous as you imagine they would doing a joke stance from a 1980 satirical comedy. I'd, I'd like to think they're doing it ironically, but this current crop of Tories are so moronically incompetent they'd make even Prince George look a genius, so I fear not. Whilst they are teaching George the heroic stance, they push Blackadder over the edge by mocking his speech he's written, so he quits the prince's service and plans to become King of Sardinia in reply to a newspaper advert by one Napoleon Bonaparte, leaving Baldrick to say, Goodbye, you lazy big nose rubber faced bastard. Which, rather than his usual laconic, witty reply, Edmund just says, I fear, Baldrick, that you will soon be eating those badly chosen words. <laughs> I wouldn't bet you a single groat that you could survive five minutes here without me. With the conclusion being the culmination of all of the gags that have run throughout the episode, with George and Baldrick confusing the actors, practicing their play, the bloody murder of the foul Prince Romero and his enormously bosomed wife, a play where the foulness of the violence and the vastness of the bosoms is entirely artistically merited for a plot to kill the prince, leading to Edmund returning in exactly... Good evening, Your Highness. <laughs> oh, black. Four minutes, 22 seconds, Baldrick. He owe me a groat. And the actors being arrested and led away to their executions. This is a really great episode, in my opinion, where all of the jokes work especially well and the entire cast, plus the guest actors of Hugh Paddock and Kenneth Connor, are used in a way that maximises the humour. The running gags are also funny to start with and then even more funny the longer they go, and by having them essentially be the plot drivers is a clever little twist on the usual Blackadder episode formula, with episode 5, Amy and Amiability, which first aired on 15th of October 1987, returning right back to the tried and tested problem of the week formula we are so used to by now. And I should really mention we get another familiar face making a guest appearance once again. I can see where your daughter gets her ready wit, sir. Hey, there you go. Although where she gets her good looks and charm is perhaps more of a mystery. Because yes, the ever talented and beautiful Miranda Richardson makes a return in a guest star role, with this episode revolving around the problem of cash or more to the point a distinct lack of it, a problem Prince George consistently had in real life and as Blackadder jokes. So what about the £5,000 that Parliament voted you only last week to drink yourself to death with? How Blackadder, 
a modest butler who steals great wedges of cash every week from the dimwit George, also has financial woes, is more of a mystery, but alas he does. But as with every episode, a problem needs a cunning plan, with Baldrick's being that they should become highwaymen, as he is somewhat fanboying for the shadow, a mysterious and shadowy highwayman. Blackadder is rather less keen on this idea, not wanting to be hung for wearing a silly hat. Instead he decides that Prince George should marry. Only one problem with that plan, out of the 262 princesses in Europe, only two are suitable. One is out because she's met him, and the other is Caroline of Brunswick, a woman who has the worst personality in Germany, which as you can imagine is quite a feat. In reality, Caroline of Brunswick was who George married. They famously hated each other and both had multiple affairs, with George possibly poisoning her when he became king. So this is another example of a far more meta approach to jokes within this series than prior ones took. With all the princesses out of the running, Edmund searches for a wealthy industrialist daughter and falls upon Amy Hardwood, who is Miranda Richardson, a meek and girly girl, or as Blackadder says, What's well, not to be fair on him, are they? The girl is wetter than a haddock's bathing costume. <laughs> Whose boorish, incredibly northern father is brilliantly played by Warren Clark. Richardson and Clark get one of two of the best jokes in this episode, where essentially, each sentence becomes a more ridiculous situation than the prior one. Surely lovers never cross such boundaries of class. Well, what about you and Mum? Well, yes, yes, I grant me when I first met her, I was the farmer's son and she was just the lass who ate the dung, but that was an exception. And Auntie Dot and Uncle Ted. Yes, yes, all right, he was a pig poker and she was the Duchess of Argyle, but... And the... Auntie Ruth and Uncle Isaiah, she was a milkmaid and he was... The, the Pope, Pope, yes! The other example of this is even funnier, where a girl Blackadder ends up holding up when he does become a highwayman, keeps one-upping herself every time she speaks. I'm pregnant, and I'm an opium fiend, and I'm in love with a poet called Shelley who's a famous whoopsie, and Mother didn't die, I killed her! It's this sort of ridiculousness I'm here for, but first the prince has to woo Amy. Sadly for him, he is the 18th century version of an unsolicited dick pic, who has a one-track mind as he himself says. Oh joy! Then come, Prince Cuddly Kitten, climb up my ivy! Sausage time! Once Blackadder has stepped in and wooed Amy on the prince's behalf, it turns out that the Hardwoods are really rather skint and living off large sandwiches, so that means they are out and highway robbery is in. Only one problem with that, they don't have a horse, as Baldrick rather amusingly explains. Hi, your horse, for ninepence, on Jewish New Year in the rain, a bare fortnight after the dreaded horse plague of old London town, with the blacksmith strike in its 15th week and the Dorset Horse Fetishists Fair tomorrow. This is actually one of the best features of Series 3, the little bits of interplay between Baldrick and Blackadder. They've never been as good as they are here before, or possibly even after. There are multiple examples of it in every single episode, such as this one. My favourite's The Shadow. What a man. They say he's halfway to being the new Robin Hood. My only halfway? Well, he steals from the rich, but he hasn't got round to giving it to the poor. <laughs> this banter between the two and the sight gags like Baldrick consistently preparing food, but really weirdly, like scrubbing a lettuce or whatever he's doing to this poor chicken throughout this episode, are a real feature of this series. Due to the lack of a horse, they have no other choice but to use Baldrick as one. Shock horror? Who could have seen that coming? The shadow turns out to be none other than Amy Hardwood, and she wants to run away with Edmund to the Bahamas, but first he needs to nick the prince's gold. Which again, shock horror, she double crosses him. Even more shock horror, Baldrick saves Edmund, who then double 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 crosses Amy and turns her in for the £10,000 reward money, which Prince George then finds and steals, meaning Blackadder has to play the prince at a game of cards. A game the prince thinks you win by losing all of your money as quickly as possible, which he's obviously a natural at. This is another very amusing outing, and one that basically highlights all that is best about this series, and sets us up nicely for the last episode, that being Duel and Duality. And then hundreds of years from now, I want episodes from my life to be played out weekly at half past nine by some, <laughs> some great heroic actor of the age. The last episode of Blackadder the Third 
is another classic Blackadder, with a brilliant guest star performance and a bunch of cunning plans going spectacularly awry. The episode opens with Prince George having finally managed to make it past first base, with not one, but two women at the same time. Only problem, they were the nieces of that homicidal maniac, the Duke of Wellington, recently returned from giving those damn Frenchies a good thrashing in Spain. He of course demands satisfaction and challenges the prince to a duel. Let the cunning plans begin. First up is Baldrick, who suggests that someone else takes the prince's place. We also get probably the most intelligent thing Baldrick ever says in all four seasons of Blackadder right here. I've heard that all portraits look the same these days because they're painted to a romantic ideal rather than as a true depiction of the idiosyncratic facial qualities of the person in question. Which comes off as a bit of a surprise and it's therefore hilarious. Even more hilarious is his suggestion that none other than Mr E Blackadder would be the perfect choice to die in place of the prince. An idea George is very pleased with, and Edmund not so much. Threatening Baldrick was one of the more amusing threats I've heard. A valued friendship ending with me cutting you into long strips and telling the prince that you walked over a very sharp cattle grid in an extremely heavy hat. After Baldrick suggests Blackadder's cousin, who just happens to be in town, Mercader, would be the perfect stand-in for his stand-in. Edmund agrees to go along with the plan. The Duke visits the Prince, but is fooled by Blackadder and the Prince swapping coats, and is in the process, inspired by Blackadder, to move Nelson from Alaska to Trafalgar in an attempt to beat Boney, leading to the Duke being rather impressed with the Prince of Wales, who he'd previously held in very low regard. He of course holds the real Prince, lapping as a butler, in about as low regard as is possible. Then Blackadder's cunning plan backfires when Makada refuses to do the duel and runs off back to the Highlands with Mrs. Miggins, which is literally the one thing she gets to do in the entire six episode arc, leaving Edmund himself to face the Duke for as he himself says. But personally, I'd mud wrestle my own mother for a ton of cash, an amusing clock and a sack of French porn. And frankly, who wouldn't? Of course the Duke being a crazed lunatic, he decides to fight with four pounder cannonettes, leading to Blackadder being shot and tragically killed. Except no, this is the one and only time that Blackadder survives the last episode, as he had earlier been given a cigarillo case by the Duke, with the regimental crest of two dead Frenchmen crossed and emblazoned on a mound of even more dead Frenchmen. And luckily the cannonball had hit directly where the case was, with this being enough to satisfy the Duke's bloodlust. Except, enter the real Prince George who reveals the ruse, which outrages the Duke who still thinks he is a simpleton of a butler rather than the Prince Regent, so he shoots him dead, not being able to contain his anger anymore. Or does he? Nope, George is a simpleton and forgot his cigarillo case, so uh, dies. Which means Blackadder is now Prince George, Seeing as King George, who thinks he is currently a small village in Lincolnshire, accepts him as such. This episode is one of the best in this series and possibly one of the top five in all of Blackadder. All of the main cast have roles to play within the narrative and those roles create a lot of opportunity for humour. As much as I love Lord Percy as a character, I don't think he ever really found his place within the group comedically as well as Prince George does. Percy would have funny moments, usually with one or the other of Blackadder and Baldrick, but this series has a lot of moments where the Prince, Edmund and Baldrick all get funny moments within a scene, and this episode is a fine example of that. Stephen Fry gives a wonderfully shouty performance as the Duke of Wellington, possibly my favourite guest appearance behind Rick Mail as Lord Flashart, if I'm being honest. As he himself says about his style of leadership. Did you ever stop bullying and shouting at the lower orders? Never! There's only one way to win a campaign. Shout, shout and shout again! He gives us a little bit of a glimpse into what's to come in Blackadder Goes Forth and his performance in that last series and it's frankly glorious, which is where I am going to leave this review with that tantalising glimpse into what is in my opinion the best comedy series ever made. I shall return with Blackadder Goes Forth in about a month. 
if everything goes smoothly, because as we are well aware, cunning plans often, if not always, come a cropper at some point.